We're in Third John this morning. If you don't know me, my name's Joe, and I'm uh, the lead minister here and typically the preacher on Sunday mornings. And uh, all that means is that I get to share God's word with you, which is probably my favorite thing to do of all things to do. So that's what we're going to do today, Third John. And we're going to wrap up a series we've been in, barring a break for Christmas Advent season, uh, a series we've been in for a few months in First, Second, and Third John. First John, a full-bodied letter to the ancient church, and then second and third John, more like postcards delivered to individuals and smaller church groups. Uh, last week, second John is probably intended to go to a house church. It's called uh, an elect lady, but I don't know that it's literally a woman, but rather a church. And at the end of the letter, he says, the children of your elect sister greet you, likely his home church where he was gathering with his friends. The elder that the letter is inscribed to, is probably John, the apostle. Uh, That's what the early church believed, and we have no reason to doubt it. He uses the same phrasing and language in all three letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. But what is maybe most important about these letters is who John is. If they are written by John, who is John? And you may know he was one of the apostles, hand-selected by Christ, but he was also the beloved one of Jesus. He was in the inner circle with Peter and James. He was so close to Jesus that he laid upon his shoulder at the Last Supper, that he was given the task of caring for Jesus' mother in her older age, you know, because Jesus had to die on the cross and then rose and ascended into heaven, he wouldn't be around. And so he dedicated Mary and John to one another as a mother and a son. What I'm trying to tell you is John is important. I'll admit my bias. He's my favorite of the apostles. If you're allowed to pick, uh, he would be my favorite. So I love John, but But I think I love John because he stands to contradict a lot of what I have believed and practiced throughout my life. I am one who historically has valued truth over love, as if the two could be separated. And when push comes to shove, truth is more important than love and kindness and grace. And what I find today in 3 John is precisely the opposite of that, that there is no truth apart from love and grace, and that there is no love without truth. They are inseparable. So let's read the letter. It's really short, and then I'll have some thoughts for you. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, It is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I'd rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, as we seek to understand and apply this text, I pray that your spirit would inspire it and would illuminate truth for us. Help us to honor you and to be faithful to your calling, to walk in truth and in love, and to exemplify your grace in our lives. All of these things we ask for your glory and in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Third John is interesting because even though it's so short, there are three different names that pop out of the text that are introduced and somewhat explained. You have Gaius, you have Diotrephes, and you have Demetrius. You have 
a faithful leader in the church who receives a letter. Then you have a false, arrogant leader of a church who is, well, we'll talk about him in a minute. And then you have Demetrius, who's sort of tagged at the end as a good, honest person. There's not a whole lot said about Demetrius, although he does seem to be a good example to follow. But there's plenty said about Diotrephes, so much so that my initial sermon for today was just a sermon on Diotrephes. And I decided that's not fair to the whole of the text. And frankly, it isn't always best to harp on the negative qualities of a bad example if you don't then give some support for the right kind of living. So here's what you shouldn't do, but here's what you should. And I think that's what we're going to try to do this morning, God helping me. So Gaius is the first one we're introduced to. He's faithful. He walks in the truth. We've already said this, but to walk in the truth is to walk in love. And so that's what we find. Gaius isn't just a good believer who believes the right things, but his belief, his mental assent, leads to a trusting life. Faith in our modern English language has been separated from faithfulness in a way that harms faith. There is no faith without faithfulness. There is no simple belief without trust. And, and it's a disservice to the good news of Jesus to say that you simply have to believe something about Jesus to be a person of faith. A person of faith is, by definition, a person of faithfulness to Jesus. So faith in Jesus is loyalty to Jesus, not simply believing something about him. Plenty of people know things about me, but only a few people trust me. It's the trusting me that matters. I hope that makes sense. So when, when we talk in the Bible about faith and faithfulness, we're talking about interchangeable concepts. It's not just that Gaius believes the right things, because it would seem that Diotrephes believes the right things. There's no accusation made later about a false narrative or a false gospel. Second John talked about an antichrist, a pseudo or alternative Jesus, a less than divine or an only divine and not human Jesus both of which are unfair presentations. So there is a, a false message, but Diotrephes is not accused of spreading a false message. Rather, he doesn't live out the message. Gaius, on the other hand, is considered faithful, not just because he believes the truth, but because it's proven in his life. He lives the truth. He is loving and gracious like Christ. And that's what we find. He is a blessing to others. He takes care of people. He accepts strangers and sends them on their journey because they are of the name, which is clearly a reference to the name of Christ. So they represent the same Christ. They need to be treated with hospitality. Gaius' example is good because it is a praising of hospitality. I don't know that we emphasize the gift of hospitality today like we should in the church. In the early church, it was without question necessary. They did not have welfare programs and motels and hotels on every corner and places for people to crash in a moment of need. As people traveled around, and especially those who were poor, they depended on the good nature of their friends or family, but the church became their family. Many of them, by following Christ, were ostracized by their loved ones who were still Jewish or Gentile pagans. And so these early Christians depended on one another for support, for daily life. They needed food, they could turn to a believer. They needed a place to stay traveling through, they could go to the home of a believer. This is really important in the early church. Today, we don't see that as much. Uh, in fact, I made the mistake of calling our welcome desk area a hospitality ministry, as if giving out coffee and hot chocolate and cookies is hospitality. I mean, it is a nice thing, but, but that's... That's a disservice to, to the real gift of hospitality, which is so much more demanding. It is to share of, of your own self with another person. It's to be willing to sacrifice. A cup of coffee is great, but, but sometimes more is required in order to show real hospitality. Gaius is hospitable. And this is, to John, a sign that he's walking in the truth. It's a fruit produced by any good Christian, the fruit of hospitality. He's not just hospitable, he is a blessing to other people. And John seems to want more blessings to come to Gaius. He prays that he would be blessed, covenantally speaking, so that he can be a blessing. That's, that's been the original story all along. Even in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17 and 21 and on and on throughout Israel's history. But, but in Genesis with Avram, who's called and becomes Abraham that we all know, even in the beginning, his calling was to be blessed, to become a blessing. 
Particularly, he and his descendants would be blessed, and through them, all the nations of the world would be blessed. This has, this has always been God's intention, that his people be blessed in order to spread the blessing, almost like a pay it forward concept. God has always intended that in his church and before, before that in his people Israel. Blessed to be a blessing. The problem is we're not always a blessing to others. Oftentimes we think the blessing is ours and ours alone, and God gave it to us because we deserve it. And other people who want a blessing should earn theirs like we did. That's diatrophies. That's the problem. But Gaius, he sees that he has been blessed and he uses it as a blessing. So Gaius is faithful. But what about Diotrephes? So here we're introduced to a bad example. And this is where I want to spend a good chunk of time. Diotrephes. We don't know much about him, whether he was a deacon or an elder or just a lay person who tried to control a church. Whoever he was, he seemed to have some power over people, some authority in his local church. And he didn't use it well. He abused his authority. He abused his power. He was arrogant. He rejected the authority of John. It's the first thing we read about him. John writes something to the churches, and this man has the gall to reject it. John, the beloved apostle of Christ, the adopted son of Mary and caretaker of Mary in her older years one who rested in the bosom of Christ at the Last Supper isn't worthy to tell this guy what faith should look like. When he writes a letter, this man has the audacity to rip it up and throw it away. Now you think about the height of arrogance that he's expressing here. So Diotrephes immediately strikes us as not a very humble person. But he's worse than that because we read next that he is uh, unhospitable, and that he vilifies people who try to be hospitable. So John says, if, as if it weren't enough, not content with that, which is the Greek equivalent of, if that weren't bad enough, guess what else he does? He turns people away, though they are brothers and sisters in Christ. When Christians come into town and need help, he says, no, we can't help you, sorry. And worse than that, when others in his church who still have a heart, when they want to show compassion, when they think, oh man, we gotta do something. We gotta let this person into our home, feed them, help them. When he sees that happening behind his back, he not only condemns it, but he excommunicates those people. He, he turns them into the bad guys. So he says, if, if you don't follow my way, then it's the highway for you. You're out. Even John doesn't excommunicate this man, Diotrephes. He exposes him, but he doesn't send him out of the church. Even John has a sense of mercy and compassion toward Diotrephes, but Diotrephes has none for the people of his own church, for those he would pretend were his friends. The more we learn about Diotrephes, the more we begin to picture people we know. Don't name names, but raise your hands if you know people who are on a power trip. Some of you are afraid to raise your hands. That's okay. I want to read you a quote from Shakespeare. Some of you know I, I was a big Shakespeare fan. Uh, I don't read as much Shakespeare now. I read too many other things. But In King Henry V, there's this quote in Act 4, Scene 3. It's just one little sentence, but it, it's powerful. Referring to the king, he is as full of valor as of kindness. Princely in both. He is as full of valor as of kindness, princely in both. This is a description of the perfect king. Valiant, brave, courageous, yet merciful and kind. And it is, in fact, the true description of Jesus Christ, who is full of valor and of kindness, who is strong and brave and yet meek and kind, all at once. Now, I would argue no human king has ever really fulfilled this wish that we might have, but Jesus does, and Diotrephes doesn't. This is the distinct difference Truth and love is, is like unto the, the compromise between power and restraint, the lion and the lamb. It's, it's this ability to, to do what is right in a way that is constructive rather than destructive. It's the ability to stand for truth and yet not knock other people down in the process. There are other analogies we could come up with or metaphors or, or the like, but, but you get the idea. It is a balancing act, and only Jesus has ever perfectly balanced these two things, two things which require one another. If Second John 
which we talked about last week, is a story of, of those who bring an antichrist into the church, a false truth, though they pretend to be loving on the surface, then we find out that that truth is no truth at all, and the love is no love at all, because the truth is not actually true. So if you come in proclaiming a different Jesus, even though you seem to be full of love, we know that that's not really God's love, because that's not really God's son, Jesus, that you're presenting. There is no love without truth. Likewise, here, we see a man who seems to present the truth, pretty matter-of-factly, and yet we find that because he doesn't know how to love, the truth he proclaims is no truth at all, because they are not separable. And it's taken me a long time to believe this, let alone to, to try and apply it in my life, that truth and love are mutually inclusive. In the church, we talk a lot about things that are mutually exclusive. Well, you can't be a Christian and vote for that person. You can't, you can't do this and call yourself a Christian. I'm using that voice because you know people who talk like that. No offense to those of you that I know talk like that. The, the, reality, is, the reality is we like this exclusivity. You're not in, you're out. You're, you're not in my group, you're out because of whatever, X, Y, Z. But we should probably spend more time talking about things that are mutually inclusive. To be in, you must X, Y, Z. I think that's just as, if not more helpful than talking about the exclusivity of the kingdom of God. Well, if they do these things, they can't be in. But what if you are in? Can you be in if you don't do these things? And I would say truth and love is a great example of that. You can't stand in the truth if you don't know how to walk in the truth. To walk in the truth is love. To stand upon truth is belief, mental assent. But to walk in it, to live it, is love worked out. Likewise, to love is to work out the truth. If you have believed a lie, no matter how hard you try to live it, it will never pan out to love the way it's meant to. You have to have both, truth and love. The elder here, who I believe is John the Apostle, rebukes only when necessary, when love is at stake, when he believes that someone who proclaims to, to preach the truth and lead a church is then working against love, pushing people out of the path of Christ into some other way an inhospitable, angry, self-motivated sort of path. And he says, that is not acceptable. And, and he doesn't fight fire with fire here. That's what we want him to do, is, you know, <laughs> clap back. I'm trying to think of, of a phrase we would use. We want him to respond in kind. We want him to retaliate. That's a good word, retaliate. But he doesn't. He just exposes this man for who he is. And he says, and if I come in person, I'll have to call him out but I'm not gonna kick him out. I think John isn't saying because he belongs here, he's doing the right things. He's saying, I don't have to kick him out because I trust that you have a Holy Spirit conscience informed of God. You know that what he's doing isn't the way of truth. I don't have to tell you. It's as if John is saying, when there's a fire, I don't have to blast back with fire. I can just hand you extinguishers. God can do the rest. Once I show you the fire, you can put it out yourselves. There's, there's a great amount of trust that John has in his people, and it's implicit here. It's not explicit, but it's implicit that he trusts them to do the right thing with this guy, Diotrephes, which is precisely what Diotrephes cannot do with his people, is trust them. As soon as they do anything contrary to his wishes, he excommunicates them, cuts them off. Anathema in the Latin, to be cut off from the body of Christ. He has no authority to cut them off of the body of Christ, and yet he does so Ironically, one who might have that authority would be John, and he doesn't do this. He shows grace. This man, Diotrephes, is malicious. We know people like him, those who are not hospitable or kind, those who are self-motivated and self-righteous and power-hungry. You've probably thought of someone by now. You've probably thought of a religious leader, maybe someone in our own community by now, who exemplifies some of these traits. Please, again, don't name names. But you know, you know there are people like this all over. How do, we, how do we not become like these people? Because as quick as I am to point fingers and say, well, I know a few people who are like Diotrephes, I also have to look in the mirror and think there are moments I'm kind of like Diotrephes. There are times in life when I struggle believing my way is the right way and everybody else should take the highway. There are times that I do what is going to get me ahead, even at the expense of the people around me. I don't want to admit that, but there are moments where that happens to me. Maybe I'm alone, but I think some of you have that same problem. How do we prevent this? 
Well, first we have to be able to spot it. Romans 16, 17, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. So Paul, again, stresses your conscience as believers, just like John tells this church and Gaius, its leader, he says, you guys need to be careful with this guy, Diotrephes. Paul says, you need to be careful with those who come in and, and breed contention in the church, the ones, the ones who, who want to break you apart and divide you. That's not the way of Christ. Watch out for those people. Stay away from those people. Don't let them have leadership over you. We have to be able to spot the, the nature of divisive leadership. A good leader is not always dividing people and turning people against each other. A good leader is able to unite people with one common good goal, as Jesus has for 2,000 years. It's humans who often lead to the division. This guy is condemned not just for his lack of hospitality, but for vilifying people who wanted to show hospitality. And herein lies the rub. I, I do know people, and it's hard not to name names, because it's so aggravating. But I know people who, who do this, who vilify, who make villains out of those who disagree with them. It's not another person that just has a different opinion. It's a villain, an enemy, a bad guy, because they have a different opinion. You don't see that from Jesus or the apostles. But it is in our human nature to do it, to make villains out of the people we disagree with. And anyone who would care to even listen to that person that I have vilified. Now they are a friend of my enemy, and so they have become my enemy. You can really whittle down a church membership doing that. As soon as you become the friend of my enemy, you are now my enemy. That's no way to live as Christians. But it's happening all the time. Just several years ago, we had a bunch of suicides happening in, in our really in the whole tri-state area, but even in our county. A lot of young people depressed, attempting or following through with suicide. Really terrible stuff. And I went in and, and was counseling young people at the, at the local high school. And through that process, I met a couple of other people, well-meaning, wonderful people, who said, we need to do something to sort of inspire these young people to talk more about their feelings, express themselves, and not go to these extremes, and swallow a bunch of pills or hang themselves. I mean, this is dark stuff. They need to be able to talk to somebody and not when it's the last ditch effort to save them. And so we came up with an idea, put a, a whole event together, got ministers from other churches involved. It was a wonderful thing. We had student councils at all the local schools meeting together. We had faculty, administrators, superintendents, the sheriff, the chief of police, all these people involved. And then there was a rumor that one guy from one church was involved. And because of that, the whole thing was now uh, a pro-LGBTQIA and anti-gun rally or something like that. You think this is funny, uh, but, but it's, it's really heartbreaking because I got a call that week and the superintendents have formally resigned from this opportunity and said their schools cannot participate. And if the schools can't participate, there is no opportunity because that was for the schools. So the whole thing got shut down. This was horrible. We had state agencies, local churches, local schools, community leaders, all involved to do something good for our young people. And because the friend of an enemy became the enemy mutually, we couldn't do it. Is that making sense? This, this sort of thinking is exactly the sort of thinking that ruins good opportunities for the kingdom of God. I can't help but wonder if some young people since then have gone through some really depressing moments that we might have been able to help with all because somebody made an enemy out of somebody who befriended somebody they didn't like. I could tell you so much more about that story, but for the sake of discretion, I won't say any more. Very, very gut-wrenching. And that's not the only example. That's just a big, broad one. But it happens every day in individuals' lives. I've encountered people through counseling and ministering to people that, that won't step foot in a church like this one, although we are a very open and, and loving place. They won't come here because they've been treated with such hate at other places that call themselves churches. They've been so put down and shamed and guilt-ridden and trampled upon that they think that's the nature of God. That's the concern with the Diotrephes. It's not just that he's a bad guy. It's that he presents a version of God that is unfair and so leads people to misunderstand not only the good news of Jesus, 
but the love of the genuine church. Even his own members who tried to show that love were shut down in the process and excommunicated. And John says, we can't stand for this because God is gracious by his very nature. And to be the church is to be a gracious people. And so if I could title my sermon now two thirds into it, the sermon is called On Being Gracious. Because the lesson I learned from Diotrephes and Gaius and and Demetrius is the difference between inhospitable attitudes and selfish motives and a spirit of graciousness. To be gracious. Why are we not gracious? It's rooted in, in the original sin of humankind and angelic beings. If you think about the fall of Lucifer in the Old Testament, if you think about the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, these these almost mythical stories, and I don't doubt that they are true, but but the way they're told is meant to evoke something deeper than just this happened a long time ago. It's a way of saying it's always happening, isn't it? The same thing. Let's look, Isaiah 14, verse 14. See if you know what I mean. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So what do you think? Oh, we jumped ahead there, sorry. So what do you think? Is that, is that still a problem that people want to ascend to the highest of heights and make themselves like God? Of course it is. This is the human problem, that we think higher of ourselves than we should, more highly than we ought to. That first sentence was pretty bad grammar, sorry. We think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Jesus, however, is the cure for that. Aaron shared it during worship earlier. I think it would be uh, appropriate to read it once again. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Now we're moving on. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, unlike the humans and angelic beings who fell, those who tried to ascend to the highest of heights and be like the Most High, here's Jesus, who is in the form of God meaning he is equal, and yet he does not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be grabbed onto. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This, this text is not just doxological, meaning intended for worship, which it was in the early church, but it is packed with conviction and meaning for every individual believer. If this is Christ, who is equal to God, yet becomes less than out of love, then who are we, being less than God, to not be willing to be counted equal to those around us? Think about that. Here's God who becomes less than he really is out of his love for you, and here are you, and you're simply asked not to try to make yourself more than you really are. God doesn't say you have to empty yourself and become less than human. What he says is, as a human, just remember you're not better than any other human. Love God and love others. To empty oneself in this way is to empty oneself of the sinful ego, of this arrogance and this sort of unhealthy pride. That's the emptying. It's not to to become less than you are. It's to recognize what you are. You are a creature endowed with the image of your creator, meant to love one another and, of course, to love him and worship him. That's the, the purpose and duty of humankind, to love God, to obey him, to love others, to share his love with others. Diotrephes couldn't figure that out. Gaius and Demetrius do figure it out, and that's the key difference. We're all sick with the same sinful root, the same problem, and that is arrogance, this desire to be higher than we really are, and yet we all have available to us the same cure, which is namely Christ Jesus, the one who has emptied himself and teaches us how we are to live. Demetrius is then a good example because he is walking in the truth. John says the truth itself testifies that Demetrius, rather than Diotrephes, is walking in the truth. That's true for believers, that when we walk in the path of truth, it is made obvious even by the truth. What we mean by that in a more practical way is what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 16, you will know them by their fruits. Truth testifies to truth. 
You want to know if someone loves Jesus? Look at their life. Jesus talked about this when he spoke of judgment. It bothers us deeply that he speaks of it as if he's judging the things we say and do rather than our belief in him. But he's judging both simultaneously, isn't he? Because they are inseparable, mutually inclusive. To love and trust Jesus is to do what he tells you. Not necessarily in perfection, but to try to. If there's no effort on your part, he says, I don't really know you at all. It still bothers us because we want it to be a simple checkbox. And yet in the mind of Christ, it's as simple as this. If you trust me, I'll see it. It'll be obvious, the things you say, the things you do. So he talks of every careless word and every careless deed. And when you didn't give water to the thirsty peasant, you didn't give me water. When there was someone hungry and you didn't care, it was me you didn't care about. Well, not literally, it's hyperbole, but he's saying, if you really loved me, I should see it in your life. And he he turns then to Diotrephes. And I think this is a prime example where he would say to Diotrephes, yeah, you spoke about me all the time, but you didn't know me. People came to you and you turned them away. Your friends tried to help them and you pushed them out. That's not my love. It seems like you never knew me at all. And John says that. Don't imitate evil, imitate good. Whoever does good is from God, but whoever does evil, it doesn't say is from the enemy. It says hasn't even seen God. To do evil is not to recognize God. It's not to have even seen him. This is the problem. We assume that people who do evil are sent by the devil or something like that. It's not the way it works. There are people who have seen God and hope to reflect him. And there are people who close their eyes to God and try not to see him for who he is. And then they don't have to reflect him. They can just do what they want. Diotrephes has his eyes tightly shut. And Gaius and Demetrius are gazing into the heavens, trying to imitate Christ. So then you have to ask, which one are you? If you look at your life, the things you say, the things you do, the fruit that is produced in your life, does truth testify to truth? Is it clear that you are walking in the love of God? That's John's big idea. And why does it matter? Why do we need to walk in the path of truth and love? Why do we need to do this? And the answer is most obvious, because God is gracious. Why should we be gracious? Why should we practice what we preach? Because God is gracious and we are his children. This whole series, Children of Light, Learning to Live as the Beloved, If John understood that he was a child of God, a beloved one of Jesus, then his goal is for you to understand what that means for you. You, this morning, and I'm telling you this in love, you are a child of God, and you are beloved of Jesus. And he has given you the Holy Spirit so that you can live as his beloved ones. So why? Because he invites us to do it. Because it's who he is, and it's the image we were made in. To not be gracious is to not be fully human. It's to be less than what you were made to be. And it is not to bring glory to God. And I hope you desire to bring glory to God. And I hope you want to be the greatest person you can be. And for these reasons, you must learn to be gracious because it is God's gift to you, his grace, in which you become rooted and from which your branches produce gracious fruit. So are you a gracious person? Are you gracious? Because if not, there will be no peace. John ends this letter saying, peace be to you. And then he greets his friends. But there can be no peace if there is no grace. Without graciousness, there will never be peace. And so Jesus invites us not just to receive his peace, but to practice his grace. What does that look like? Well, Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 35 popped into my mind for a reason that may, may not have struck any of you, and it has to do with the Koine Greek words, and I'll, I'll tell you in a second. So let's read it. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Has anybody ever heard this before? Okay. Sermon on the Plain in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke's Gospel, it's the Sermon on the Plain. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. In Matthew's Gospel, I think it says even Gentiles Uh, meaning unbelievers. Sorry, uh, yeah, there we go, who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. And this is, this is the big one. And you will be like sons, excuse me, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful 
and the evil. Do these things. Give to those without expecting a return. Love your enemies. Do good. And there's no because of this. It's just do good. Just do good and lend without expecting in return and love your enemies because then you will have a reward and you will be sons and daughters of the Most High God. This is God's purpose for you because of who he is. The last part of that verse, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. The reason I picked that passage is because the word benefit and the word credit is mistranslated in English. At least I think so. Anybody know what the word charis means in Greek? It's where we get the word charisma or charismaticism. It means gift. Or most often in English, we say grace. It's the same word. Grace and gift are the same word in Greek. It's another problem in the church. We make fancy words when they're just normal words. Uh, So when we say God's grace, we are literally saying God's gift, that he gives freely. That's what grace is. It's a free gift. So then why translate these words as benefit and credit when they are the same word in Greek as grace? If we were to reread that passage and, and try to imagine with me Jesus preaching this sermon and what they would have heard, he says, if you only love those who love you, where's the grace? If you lend to those who are going to pay you back, where's the grace? What grace is that? If you, if you only care about those who care about you, there's no grace in it. It's not gracious behavior. Even sinners do that stuff. That's what everybody does. Things that benefit you, things that help you get ahead, things that keep you equal, those are all things that sinful people do. But the grace of God is to go beyond that, to do what may harm you for the sake of another, to give freely. That's grace. And he says, what benefit is that to you? What benefit is that to you? What credit is that to you? All three of those could be translated, where's the grace in that? Or how have you shown grace? So then the question we need to live with every day is this, how have I shown grace? Love your enemies, do good, lend without expecting anything in return. Then your reward will be great because then you are children of the most high God who loves, who shows kindness to the ungrateful and the wicked. There's a real problem here with graciousness to not be a Diotrephes, but instead to be like Gaius or Demetrius, to show grace. There's a problem, and that is the world we live in. Because the world we live in is not a very gracious place. In fact, being gracious is really hard in this world. Not that long ago at a restaurant, I saw a young, probably 17, 18-year-old waitress carrying a platter of drinks and she flipped and spilled and a drink got all over a guy and he started cussing her up and down and yelling and asking for towels. And he was irate. It was obviously an accident. She would have never done it on purpose although she probably wanted to do it again after he yelled at her. Uh, and she walked away in tears. It's hard to be gracious in our world. On this day, January 9th, 1941, in Bucharest, Romania, 6,000 Jews were murdered in a pogrom just because they were Jewish. It's hard to be gracious There's a man in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, named Robert McCall. He had aplastic anemia and was told he had maybe three weeks to live unless he got a bone marrow transplant. Found out that he had a cousin named David who had a perfect match. And his cousin David said, Robert, I'll give you the bone marrow so you can live. And they celebrated, and the family was so excited. And the day came for surgery, and Robert had a few days to think about it. Excuse me, David, the cousin, had a few days to think about it, and he called Robert and said, I can't go through with it. I'm really sorry, but I'm afraid. They say it's painful. I don't know if I'm going to need that bone marrow myself. I just don't know anything about it, and I'm terrified. I don't know that I can do it. And Robert tried to convince him, and David said, no, I'm not going to budge. I can't do it. Robert, knowing he may only have a couple of weeks left to live, took the matter to court. And in common pleas court, under Judge Flaherty, he basically uh, indicted his cousin for murder. He wanted to. He, he pressed charges saying, this man has denied me life. He's killing me. And of course, the court was forced to admit, he's not killing you. He's just choosing not to give you life. And sadly, in the courts of this country, there's no law or provision made to force someone to give life. Now, had he actually murdered your loved one, we could, we could do something about that. But 
but I as a judge can't make him give you life. And I also cannot make you forgive him for denying you life because there are some things that the court just can't do, things that are matters of the heart. Where's the grace? Of of what grace is that? Graciousness is hard. I had a quote, one more quote I want to share with you this morning from Rochelle Goodrich, and she wrote, she's a famous poet and playwright, she wrote, if you think the most courageous and difficult thing you can do is to stubbornly stand your ground, try graciously giving in. And I'll say it again, because it's, it's profound. If you think the most courageous and difficult thing you can do is to stubbornly stand your ground, then try graciously giving in. And anyone who's tried it can tell you the latter is actually much harder than the former. It's hard to be gracious. Would you stand with me as we close? When I read Luke 6.35 at the end of that passage, God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked, I was reminded of, of a really great story that I was told by a former Bible preaching professor and one of my favorite preachers ever. He tells this story. He's now dead. He died in 2015. But he told this story to us years ago about a former student he had in seminary. And this, this young man was a promising, promising preacher. And he sent him out with his blessing and said, you're going to do great things. And several years later, the young man showed up on a Sunday morning at the church where this professor was a preacher on Sundays. A lot of seminary professors preach on Sundays at churches. So he was a professor who also preached, and this guy showed up at his church after a sermon, came up to talk to me. He said, you probably don't remember my name. He said, no, you're right. I I remember the face, though. I know I had you in class. So he told him his name, and he said, I just came to tell you in person that I'm stepping away from the church, and I'm leaving the ministry. And before the rumor mill spreads, I I wanted you to know from me directly that I really respected you. You were kind to me. You made me feel like I could do this, but I just don't believe I can do it anymore. I've sort of lost my way. I'm frustrated with God. I've got a lot of questions, and I just don't think it's right for me to preach right now. And he said, I just wanted to tell you, and he shook his hand and he left. And the preacher had a bunch of other people waiting to shake his hand, so he couldn't really do anything about it. But then he went out to the parking lot several minutes later, and the guy was still out there standing by his car. And he came up to his old professor and he said, I thought of something else I wanted to ask you. Do you remember the day in class when you asked us, you were talking about just preaching one thing, having one real big point on a Sunday morning, something people could could think on and take home. He said, do you remember you told us as homework to pick our favorite verse, one verse out of the whole Bible and bring it back in for the next class? And he said, yeah, I remember I, I did that with almost every class. He said, okay, well, do you remember what mine was? And he said, no, no, I don't, uh, but you can remind me. So the young man told him it was Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he looked at him and he said, that's great. That's a good verse. And then the young man said, do you remember what your verse was? And he, he did because the class had basically chided him to tell them his verse at the end. They, he said they had no respect. They was, come on, tell us what yours is, tell us what yours is. So he finally did, and he said, I guess if I had to pick Luke 6.35, which is exactly why it's, this story stands out to me. Luke 6.35, we just read it. God is kind, or the Lord is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. The Lord is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And he looked at the young man, and he said, well, is your verse still true? And he said, well, yeah, the the Lord is my shepherd. I know that. I mean, I've I've sort of turned loose of God in the church, but I know he hasn't let go of me. But I was hoping you could tell me if yours is still true. And he said, yeah. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so grateful that you are gracious, even when we're not. Even when we're ungrateful, you are gracious. Even when we're wicked, you are gracious. When we're faithless, you remain faithful. And so we cling all the more tightly to you and pray that we might show some of the grace that has been shown to us. In the name of Christ, your son, we pray, giving you all the glory and the honor forever and ever. Amen.